Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here today with Professor Ashley D. Farmer, who's Assistant Professor of History and African American Studies at Boston University and the author of the just published Remaking Black Power, How Black Women Transform an Era, just published by the University of North Carolina Press. How are you doing today, I'm Professor? I'm good. Good to see you. So the last time you were on the show, um, you joined us. You were in the late stages mm -hmm. of, of your book. Um, it's now done. Uh, how's it feel to have it out in the world? Um, a little bit exciting and a little scary. Exciting in the sense that it's kind of your baby that you've been working on for yeah. forever. Um, but then um, also kind of scary to see people's reactions to it and yeah. want to know if they're positive or negative or um, sometimes you're really invested in making sure you got the story as right as you could. Right. Um, so you're hoping that people who are around and who live during this period kind of see that and see your effort behind that. You know, when you pose to folks that it's a book about the role of black women in the black liberation movement, mm -hmm. uh, you know, really going from post-World War II mm -hmm. up until, you know, the 1980s, um, I imagine a, a lot of folks don't know the stories of many of these women. Mm -hmm. um, as a researcher, and, and I heard the Voyeus Glimp talk about this one time, um, about the challenge of trying to find stuff in the archive. Mm -hmm. um, what was the challenge for you trying to find documents? Mm -hmm. You know, as a historian, they're like, well, you know, where's the document? Where, where, yeah. Where's the primary sources? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a really great question. A question um, that was especially interesting for me because I also consider myself to be a historian of intellectual history. Um, so there's a big question of kind of black women's um, intellectualism. Where does it happen? How do we document it? And um, what counts as evidence of that? Um, so the main problem I ran into was this idea that that everybody thinks that because the black power movement had sexist elements in it, mm -hmm. um, black women weren't organizing, let alone theorizing. Um, and I think that this has somewhat overdetermined how we think about it mm -hmm. to the point that we were missing things right under our noses. Um, so to give you an example, um, the Black Panther Party newspaper, right. something people use all the time. Um, nobody had really talked about the women who were artists for the paper. They'd right. only talked about Emory Douglas. Right. Or talked about something like the Sisters section, which is a whole section or column dedicated to black women who want to be Black Panthers or encouraging people to be Black Panthers. Um, another example would be cultural nationalism, very um, considered very um, conservative, something right. where people are often talking about black women being in the home, right. caring for children. Right. Um, but if you read like their handbooks and their women's columns, you see them negotiating that right. idea of conservatism while pushing the boundaries of it to be more gender inclusive. Um, so part of it was me having to retrain my own self mm. um, to go back and kind of look again and see what I had missed um, under the auspices that um, people only theorize through political tracks or through speeches or through um, you know these kind of essays in that way. Um, and another thing was just trying to rethink where that happens. Sometimes it's in a cartoon, sometimes it's satire, sometimes it's um, a, a meeting that's just recorded and transcribed and published, yeah. right? But all of that is evidence of black women thinking through ideologies, thinking through their gender identity, thinking through their racial identity, and wanting um, to assert a form of politics and ideology in that process. You start the book talking about the work of uh, activist and theorist Claudia Jones mm -hmm. um, and her own theorization about the role of the black woman domestic. Mm -hmm. You also talk about the work of Alice Childress mm -hmm. um, and particularly her character Mildred. Yeah. What took you to that part of the archive? Um, these folks who are really thinking about how do we take this figure that, mm -hmm. that's really ground zero mm -hmm. in the black representational battle and the you know in the black radical battle mm -hmm. over representation mm -hmm. you know Mammy is ground yeah. zero there. Yeah. Talk about that, you know, the work of Childress and, yeah. and Claudia Jones. Um, so the interesting thing about this is um, the book ends with the Third World Women's Alliance, and it was interviewing those women who actually told me mm -hmm. that I needed to go back and tell this story from a larger period. They um, convinced me that um, my focus on the 60s and 70s, maybe the early 80s, was a little too small, and really they were kind of the ideological heirs of these post-war women of the, of the 40s and 50s. Um, and the women that they were talking about about somebody like Claudia Jones. She's mm -hmm. a member of the Communist Party from a young age and is really one of their foremost theorists. Um, and from there I see her, I read her tracks particularly about the black domestic worker um, as understanding a moment that 
is simultaneously really downtrodden or yeah. super exploited, as she calls, but also this space and this person and this idea of intense possibility for radicalization. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what is th what's great about sh um, Jones's work is her kind of simultaneous um, analysis of the problem, this kind of intersectional analysis before right. there was before intersectionality, right. Right. Um, but also saying all is not once, like we can, we can capture this and bottle this and really make this kind of the vanguard of the movement um, and not in the process transform cultural understanding of black women mm -hmm. is a political, as dumb, as dirty, as mm -hmm. all these things that most people think black domestic workers are. And then as for Childress, who comes along, you know, about the same time, but a little bit later, her satire about Mildred, a black domestic worker, right. is fantastic, you know, and it's turning everything you think about black women on its head, because um, Mildred moves to the city, she talks about anti-colonial politics, right. she talks about black nationalism, she tells off her employer, but at the same time, she's articulating a radical mm -hmm. internationalist politics from the vantage point of black working women. You know, we talk all the time about Just Be Simple, um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes' character. Yeah. You know, why do you think a character like that so overshadowed, uh, you know, our memory of someone like Mildred and, yeah. and the work of Alice Children? I mean, I think a large of it is, um, you know, patriarchy and the access to spaces mm -hmm. for publication that mm -hmm. um, he had. And I think that, um, you know, th there's this idea that perhaps still maintains that black working class women don't have anything to say. Um, and I think that that goes back to the days of the post-war, and really what they're trying to argue against is, you know, these people actually have perhaps the most astute right. understanding of right. politics and the world, because you're living it every day, and you know what needs to be fixed on the ground level. Uh, the part of your work that's probably most well known, of course, is the role of black women in the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. um, when you first come to that work, you know, what are your sense of that relationship, and what changes over the period of time that you that you do the research and write the book? Yeah, you know, at first I was really looking for um, just evidence that black women were there mm -hmm. and organizing. Um, but at the same time, I say this often that like, I wanted to tell a different story because every story was basically black women serving breakfast in the free <laughs> breakfast program, you know? And I love the free <laughs> breakfast program, it's great, but like, I thought to myself, this party was massive and a national, international scale, surely black women were doing more mm -hmm. than simply, you know, these survival programs. Not that they're not important, but that's not the sum total. Um, so that is what really forced me to go back and say, are they talking to each other? Mm -hmm. Do they, are they have dialogues with the men? Um, how d are they ascribing to all the things that the Panther Party is saying they're standing mm -hmm. for? Or are they just, you know, as people say, kind of just in and out and being kind of the rank and file? And really going back to that work and seeing, uh, going back and looking at the Black Panther newspaper again was really what transformed that. Also, again, here's another example of why it's so important to talk to the people that you're researching, because it was these women who cued me into these drawings that they were writing or said, you know, go look up my article right. in this that somebody right. has glazed over, you know, right. a bunch of times. So they know what was happening, um, and they have, they were, have time and time again been like a generative source of teaching me how to research and write oh, yeah. this correctly. Yeah. You know, some of the, the sexism and patriarchy within the movement, of course, was real. Mm -hmm. How did they navigate some of those spaces? Yeah, well, so the common solution, the common narrative is either they were just kind of super oppressed and didn't do anything, or, mm -hmm. they, or they left and joined feminist organizations. And so my book argues that there's kind of this third way, where they try to change it from within the movement and within the major organizations like the Panther Party or the Congress of African People or whatnot. Um, and one of the ways they do that is by writing about it. They're saying, you know, if you're going to be as like radical as you say you are, if you're going to be a nationalist, if you're going to be a revolutionary nationalist, then you can't have this limited idea of revolution or mm -hmm. liberation, you know? So they're kind of using their own, um, particularly black men's own ideologies and pronouncements and doctrine, taking it, reformulating it to fit their lives and be applicable in the most expansive sense and then kind of throwing it back to them and saying, right. you know, who's the revolutionary right. now, you know? Right. Yeah. Some of the works that I found really fascinating was when you really dig into what was going on at Karinga's Us mm -hmm. and also the Committee for United Newark. Mm -hmm. um, these deep cultural nationalist organizations, mm -hmm. as you mentioned earlier, that hold in many ways some very traditional ideals mm -hmm. about marriage, about the role of women mm -hmm. in the household and outside of the household. Um, how difficult was it actually to find information on that? Because in some part, that's it may be the least well-known part mm -hmm. of the archive that, that you endeavor to examine in the book. Yeah, you know, and that's the one that I thought, I, I originally thought was going to be the hardest, but in actuality, like, 
it, it's really all right there. I mean, so much so that these things aren't even in an archive. They're microfilmed in libraries. They're here. They're a bunch of places. Um, they're part of like Amiri Baraka's papers, right. um, the Committee for Unified Newark's papers. But um, really what's happening there is that, again, it's this idea that because cultural nationalism, or in particular Kawaida, mm -hmm. originally said that black women should be behind the scenes, nobody just bothers to look for the ways in which they're negotiating right, that in a more nuanced back, way. Right, right, um, right. So like you said, it might be an article, it might be a handbook which I read in which the first half is kind of reasserting the doctrine, because they don't think it's all bad, you know, right, they find value right, in it. Right. And then the second half is like, so we're cool with that, but right. here's <laughs> how we're gonna reformulate that um, to talk about it in a more expansive sense. So one of the things I think that particularly women in cultural nationalist organizations were particularly astute at is that kind of dance, you know, saying there's really restorative qualities to what we have going mm -hmm. on here, there's mm -hmm. real value to it, and we can tweak this to make this work for us in ways that I think we're often overlooked, but folks like Amiri Baraka, folks like Karenga himself say, really transform their thinking on how to understand right. revolution in that way. Uh, how, were the women who you interviewed surprised that this was a, a project that you were doing? Um, mostly excited. Um, they kind of felt like finally somebody's gonna talk about right. this, you know, and, and, and asking them, you know, not just what did you do, but like, did you believe in this ideology? Uh -huh. You know, what, how would you describe your politics? Right. What did it mean to be a revolutionary? Um, I think they're used to kind of people coming and talking to them about kind of the rake and file work, which is great, yeah. um, but less so asking them, you know, why did you choose this group versus that group? What about the ideology fit your life in a way that it wasn't the other way. Um, so, but by the same time, um, it's also important that the, we understand that these women went through very real hardships through Cointelpro mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of surveillance. Um, so they're also, um, you know, somewhat cautious, and rightfully so, of making sure that the story is told with attention to detail and um, in a narrative that feels true to the way they experienced right. it. You know, I'm reading uh, Patrice Cullors. Khan's mm -hmm. memoir with, with Aisha Bandeli now, um, there's a way in which Patrice Cullors is, is more visible than any of the women yeah. who were engaged um, in doing this kind of work um, in the 60s and the 70s and earlier, of course. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is to be said about the high visibility of black women as radical thinkers and radical activists? or at least the, more, the increased visibility of black women in that role now. Yeah, you know, so I mean, so a lot of ways, one of the things I love about the moment we're in is um, you're really kind of seeing um, some of the issues of black power be worked out and come to fruition in really beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. One of them is this idea that, I mean, yeah, black women were theorizing and leading, so like, let's, ago, just, right. let's just, let's <laughs> let's acknowledge that, let's not try to make them hide behind that, and, right. let's, um, and let's really listen to their analyses. Um, but the same token, I think one of the things that was really hidden about black power, like I said, was the government repression mm -hmm. and the violence, mm -hmm. both mental, physical, emotional, that black women went through. Um, so, uh, my hope is that with that visibility, I know there's going to come heightened violence for the women that are doing that now, right. but I hope that we kind of acknowledge that um, and discuss that and engage in that and try to protect people from that as much as possible. Yeah. You're watching Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Ashley D. Farmer. She's the author of the new book, Remaking Black Power, How Black Women Transform an Era, published by University of North Carolina Press. She is Assistant Professor of History and African American Studies at Boston University. Um, did you get a chance to see Black Panther yet? I did. I've seen it <laughs> twice. <laughs> so, you know, the, the old head in me worries um, that there's now a generation of young folks that will know who T'Challa is mm -hmm. before they ever know who Huey Newton yeah. <laughs> or Bobby Seale is. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you feel about Black Panther in terms of, on the one hand, representing part of this radical tradition mm -hmm. that it really can't be separated from? Mm -hmm. Um, first of all, I'm really excited. It was a beautifully shot, beautifully made Absolutely. film. Um, I, I, I love the way in which it is inspiring people to just understand blackness, think about the diaspora, think about Africa, both mm -hmm. in our, in like our popular and cultural imaginary very differently, mm -hmm. um, and modernity very differently. Um, I share probably some of the concerns that you do, <laughs> um, you know, with um, the association of Black Panther with this instead of, you know, kind of the Black Panther party. But like, it also presents a really wonderful opportunity for people like me and educators to go right. and say, you know, what parts of this do you see? You know, here's what you have in the movie. Right. Here's what the Black Panthers were, in what ways what can we see, see right. that synergy or dialogue, or what ways is a legacy, and also what are the limitations of right. that? How much right. of the Black Panther Party was of its time and of its moment, and this Black Panthers we imagine it is kind yeah. of a different creature that we need to understand in that way. Yeah. 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 Uh, How do you feel about the women characters? 
Uh, the first time I saw it, I was in awe. You know, I mean, right. it, it was wonderful to see strong women characters. It was wonderful to see um, the men treat them as equals. And very different kinds of black mm -hmm. women. Right? Yes. You know, um, everything from a kind of female masculinity mm -hmm. to a more traditional femininity. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we get to see a STEM black yes. woman, and right, who's just, just pure science, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from that point, I loved it. Um, the second time, I think I longed for a little bit more. I mean, one, at the heart of Black Panther tradition, the kind of this tradition versus innovation or modernity mm -hmm. idea is also kind of which way forward to liberation, mm -hmm. right? Is, is, is it this isolationist approach? It, you know, how much should Africa and those of us in the diaspora expect to, you know, help each other, field off each other, reconcile each other? And you see that um, between T'Challa and Killmonger. But, um, that debate is still largely playing mm -hmm. out largely among black men. Um, and I would love to see, um, you know, future characters kind of weigh in on, you know, that kind of discourse, whether we should be thinking of the future of black liberation and a Pan-Africanist sentiment. Has that tie been severed right. too much to, you know, keep moving forward in a productive way? Yeah. yeah. The African American Intellectual History Society, mm -hmm. um, in which uh, you have a, a huge imprint on these days. Um, Talk about the development of that organization and, and the way that it's really just blossomed over the last couple of years. Um, to see the range of folks that you publish on a daily basis, the range of things that get covered, your ability to pull together, um, you know, sustained forums. Uh, the week that we're recording this now, that you're doing a forum on mm -hmm. W.E.B. Du Bois mm -hmm. to, to kind of mark his birthday. Mm -hmm. um, talk about the organization a little bit. Yeah, so the organization was actually founded by Chris Cameron in 2014, and the idea behind it originally was just a blog to talk about black intellectual and intellectualism. Mm -hmm. So whether that be individual black thinkers across the diaspora, modes of thinking, um, questions of availability of sources like we talked about earlier. Um, and Chris invited, um, was very forward thinking in inviting a range of people from different backgrounds right. to kind of blog. So it started to get this very consistent content of, you know, the same idea of ideas, but from very, very different right. perspectives. Um, so it quickly blossomed by 2015 into an offline organization. Um, and we had our first conference, I think, in 2016 here mm -hmm. at UNC Chapel Hill, for which you were the yeah. keynote speaker. Um, so we're now to our third conference at Brandeis this upcoming March next month. Um, will Barbara Ransby will be the speaker of. So um, it's, it's become a really great kind of online and offline space. Um, Keisha Blaine really, as our senior blog editor, has been also very forward thinking and trying to um, um, imagine the range of ways in which right. we can talk about this. And she's published a great yeah, new book yeah, herself. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, so, um, so I think it, it, it's been great to see a couple of people really um, think about and envision what scholarship can look like online, mm -hmm. um, what a public debate that's mm -hmm. not behind a paywall mm -hmm. and not written crazy inaccessible jargon, you know, can do. Um, what a debate among scholars in the open around an idea right. like W.B. Du Bois can do. Um, and also just, um, you know, what is it to be an intellectual in this space, in this digital moment? Yeah. yeah. Talk about your, your uh, traveling to this point, right? Mm -hmm. how, how do you become a historian? Oh, How do you become a, a, a public intellectual? <laughs> Is that what I am now? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, I think um, a little bit of ha a, a driving interest in black women, but not really sure how to shape it. Mm -hmm. A couple of really great teachers and mentors and a little mm -hmm. bit of luck, which is probably how it always goes. Um, but I actually, I went to Spelman College um, where I was a French and Spanish major. So a totally <laughs> different path um, than I'm on today. And um, I did study abroad in Martinique and Costa Rica because at Spelman you learn about the diaspora. Right. You don't really right. learn, you know, everything is black women centered in that way. Um, and my teachers were wonderful enough to say, you know, we think what you're really interested in is less kind of the language, but more the culture, culture. and the history. Right. Those are the right. places where you really seem right. to enjoy yourself. That's when you get excited about writing. So maybe you need to think about broaching yeah. this not from that side, but the other side. Um, and so I also had a great um, professor at the time, Jelani Cobb, was there teaching yeah. black history at the time. Um, he was very encouraging. Um, so I just had a great group of people that said, you know, you can make the you can answer the kinds of questions that drive you this yeah. way. And also like, we'll show you the nuts and bolts of how to do it. Cause I had not really known anybody in my family or anybody who had ever gotten a PhD in kind of the yeah. humanities like that. You know, yeah. Stanley Nelson's um, film uh, just debuted a few mm -hmm. days ago about HBCUs. Yeah. Um, we, we recorded Rache Barnes earlier mm -hmm. from Yale, who's also oh, a Spelman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Spelman grad. Um, how important are HBCUs at this moment? Crucial. I mean, like when I say that there is, I mean, there is no other place like them, and uh, they take um, young black people and young black minds and just nurture them so fully. 
you know? Like, you know, people often say, um, you know, you can't kind of stay in that cocoon forever, but those four years really do equip you to navigate the world differently and offer you, I mean, one of the rarest opportunities to center your experience in whatever mm -hmm. you're doing, whether that's studying French, whether that's studying black studies, et cetera. Um, and imagine, you know, I, I think of college as this moment when, um, you know, if you're doing it right, it should question, you should make mm -hmm. you question everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you have great teachers, it should really um, make you reorder everything. So imagine if you can do that kind of shake up in a space that nurtures you mm -hmm. and centers your experience. It's fantastic. Um, and also they're just important because, um, you know, it, it gives black people a chance or a choice to be in kind of a counter public space, you know, and not be susceptible to all of the microaggressions and everything that happens every day. It's one of the few spaces where you can say, I choose to do this. Mm. And it's not and it's not a step down or a lesser mm -hmm. than it's a, it's a, just a space that you can be in that still can provide you with everything that you mm -hmm. need. What's next for you, Professor Farmer? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, I think a little book touring for the rest of the year. Um, and then um, actually Chris Cameron, Keisha Blaine, and I have an anthology coming out this year, New Perspectives on the Black Intellectual Tradition, um, which takes a bunch of junior scholars and um, some, many of whom um, mm -hmm. blog for AAIHS um, and take some of their scholarship and writes about it. And then um, maybe thinking about book two. Right. Yeah. And you're doing a series also, uh, a oh, book yes. series, yes. <laughs> <laughs> with, 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 with American yes. Book Award winner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that big. Uh, yes, in addition to that, um, Ibram X. Kendi, who um, won the um, National Book Award for Stamped, a phenomenal mm. book, and I have just started a series, the Black Power series with NYU Press. Um, so we are searching for um, you know, great new up-and-coming authors yeah. um, talking about black power and black radicalism in that kind of broadest sense. Mm. Yeah. We've been joined this afternoon by Professor Ashley D. Farmer, the author of Remaking Black Power, how Black Women Transform an Era, University of North Carolina Press. She is an assistant professor of history and African American studies at Boston University for a little while. Um, thanks for joining us, Ashley. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Black lights and boots burn when I record for watch. And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything, y'all. We taking it back.